And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is RJ Spina, who has verifiably healed himself of permanent chest down paralysis, severe chronic illness, and life-threatening conditions through his own authentic transcendence. His teachings, wisdoms, guidance, and revolutionary self-healing and self-realization technique has already completely changed and saved the lives of many across the globe, and today we're going to learn about it. RJ, thank you so much for being my guest today, and welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. It's my pleasure. So if you don't mind, let's just start with your history. You know, have you had any paranormal things in your history which led you to be able to to heal yourself in the first place. Yeah, a- absolutely. So um, Jeff is a little kid. Uh, I would, without uh, effort, without trying, and certainly without any um, direction or training, I would just leave my body. Uh, when I was relaxed, sitting in a chair or lying down, sometimes uh, maybe just prior to going to sleep, I would all of a sudden close my eyes and I was literally, my consciousness, was just outside of my body. I'd be standing next to my body. I'd be hovering over my body. I'd be on the ceiling looking down. Sometimes I would literally, my consciousness would appear on the roof of uh, my parents' house. So this was uh, totally normal. And like I said, I you could say I came into this world very detached uh, from the human experience or from the human condition. And so I never really identified with being human and I would just leave my body. Uh, this progressed. This is as a little kid. I realized that right away I was pure spirit, that I certainly wasn't this, this suit, the suit, the body-mind complex, that I was soul, spirit. And I, I quickly realized that uh, through intention, I could go anywhere that I wanted to. And at first it was just I thought that I might be limited to like the local neighborhood or things like that. And I would my consciousness would actually – go up and down the block or then go to school where, you know, where I would go to school. But then I realized that if I wanted to go to outer space, I could go to outer space. My consciousness would just start moving. And it's interesting how it moves, by the way, is that it's here and then it's here and then it's here. It's not smooth in the way that we process things. Like like when we watch a movie, every scene flows, every frame flows. My experience is that it's not like that. It's these gigantic jumps. You're here, and then you're all the way over here. But I, without really realizing what I was doing, or certainly without the intellect to understand what I was doing, I would start to experience literally different realms, different frequencies, uh, completely different states of consciousness where I would interact with highly advanced beings. And I realized I could go anywhere and do anything. And I was able to do this as a, as a child. And I even had a mantra, which is really bizarre. As a little kid, it would just come out of me. And the mantra was, wherever I would go, I would say, I retain all information and knowledge contained within this realm. And I would say it over and over and over again. And I felt like every time I went somewhere, Jeff, and then would drop back into my body, so to speak, I literally felt like I had retained what was there. And I don't know where that mantra came from, but that's exactly what I would say. And so my whole childhood, I did that. Um, As a kid, I also said to my parents and my friends, as ridiculous as it sounds, if I ever get sick, I'll just heal myself. So this remembering or talent or ability or gift or however you want to describe it, I knew it was in me. I knew that if I ever did get sick, I would be able to put myself back together. And not coincidentally, my last name is Spina, which actually means spine. So uh, lo and behold, fast forward 45 years, <laughs> roughly later, 2016, I was very, very ill, sepsis. I was- let, let me stop you there just before we get into that. I want to ask you something. Is it possible that you had an NDE as a child or something happened to you that created a crack in the veil for you to be able to do this? Jeff, it feels to to me that what I'm doing and talking about and what I was experiencing is really second nature. It's really me. It doesn't feel to me that it was brought upon by a near-death experience or something traumatic. 
I just literally discovered that if I just relaxed, I could just leave my body. And it was through relaxation that I would just, I would literally just pop right out of my body. And that felt normal. And that felt like me and being able to explore and understand what I was experiencing also felt like me. It was much more difficult to be RJ, whoever RJ really is. Uh, that felt more like myself and that felt more real in that sense. And in a lot of ways, it still, it still does. And, uh, as I said, about 45 years later, I led a very, from the outside looking in, it was a normal life. I had normal jobs. Um, at 24, my abilities, uh, clairsentience, clairvoyance, claircognizance seemed to increase at around 24 through a specific meditation that I did. And so I started giving people past life readings and things like that. And then I realized I wasn't really helping them because they started identifying with those lives, further sort of, um, imprisoning their consciousness through more identification instead of liberating their mind. So I just kind of stopped doing that. Um, but I started teaching meditation. I started teaching some of the things that I was doing, some of the things that I understood in terms of metaphysics, in terms of body, mind, uh, sentience and energy frequency, how to move your energy. But then at 45, I became deathly sick. So Jeff on, uh, it was April 23rd, 2016. Uh, I was paralyzed from the chest down. I was diagnosed with type one diabetes, Hashimoto's autoimmune disease, uh, hypothyroidism, pancreatitis, thyroiditis, and then something also called uh, autonomic dysreflexia. And autonomic dysreflexia is, can be lethal. And, and it happens to paraplegics and quadriplegics who have had an injury above T6 in, in their back. And the, the major component of my injury was T7 and T8. Uh, so autonomic dysreflexia uh, crashes your autonomic system. And essentially our autonomic, autonomic system are the things that run automatically, breathing, heart rate, pulse, body temperature. And so when there's damage to that area of the spine, your autonomic system is haywire. You actually stop breathing. Your pulse skyrockets, your body temperature drops. So it, in, a, in a way, it was almost like an, uh, a remembering of an ancient yogic kind of practice to be able to regain control of my autonomic system, my heart rate, my pulse, my body temperature. And I literally had to remember or learn how to do that. There were about five different trips to the ER because I, I was about to lose consciousness. And you can, you can literally uh, have a stroke. Uh, you can go into a coma. You can die. And a lot of paraplegics die from that. So there was a, a host of stuff. It wasn't just one thing. It wasn't just the paralysis. Uh, but when I had awakened from the emergency surgery, and the surgery was what's called a laminectomy, that's where they scrape off, or that's what they did for me. They scraped off the infection that was literally on my spine, and uh, which probably saved my life for sure. But the damage to my spine was already done. I was paralyzed before the surgery, and clearly I was paralyzed after. Uh, but Jeff, when I woke up, from surgery, the best way I can describe it is that when I said as a little kid that if I ever get sick, I'll just heal myself, that inner knowingness, the veil had been removed. So it's literally like someone took the curtain and just went like this and the memory, and it literally felt like a muscle memory, all of it came back to me. It's almost like if you memorized a, a movie script you know, your part in a play, your part in a movie, and then all of a sudden the character came back and all the lines came back. It's an analogy. But that's what it was like. I knew exactly what to do. I knew exactly how to do it. And even in the ICU, uh, as soon as I woke up, the whole thing came back to me. The ICU nurse came in to see if I'm okay. I'd finally, you know, woken up. I literally started explaining to her in great detail exactly how I was going to put my destroyed body back together, the metaphysics, the protocols, the exercises. And she's looking at me. She's like, how, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I just remember. She was probably thinking, sure, RJ, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, of course. Right. Of course. And a few of the, you know, the, the surgeon came in maybe about 18 hours later, the neurosurgeon, great, great surgeon. And of course he announced, to me, after I had told everybody I was going to put myself back together, he then informed me, my partner, the infectious disease doctor, and everyone else that you're permanently paralyzed. You can't recover. 
no one recovers. Your spine is damaged, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, you're alive. Hopefully mm -hmm. you don't have sepsis. And so, but you know, you're paralyzed from the chest down and that, and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I knew better. Well, how'd you heal yourself? Yeah, right. That's the question. Mm -hmm. So the book, Supercharged Self-Healing, there were seven things, Jeff, that I, I found myself doing repeatedly in order to put myself back together. Uh, there's two main components that I like to talk about. The book explains it in great detail, and then all the other people that I've helped with the same Ascend the Frequency Healing Technique, and they've been able to repair themselves uh, even when they couldn't get better for 10 years, 20 years. So the foundation, Jeff, is removing yourself from what I call the ego mind identity. Okay, the limitation that you're just the body, the five senses, and the intellect. Okay, that is just the suit that we're wearing. We are not the suit. Okay, we are consciousness and energy, sentience, whatever word you want to use, that goes well beyond the body mind and what the body mind, how the body mind operates. The body mind is part of physical reality, it's a suit that is part of and attuned to our local environment. That is not what we are. We slide into the suit and we call that birth and we slide out of that suit and we call that death. Now, upon the detachment from the body-mind complex, and you can think of that through meditation, if you wanna think of it that way. And I've been a relentless meditator and explorer of consciousness starting as a child, as we talked about before. So I knew I was spirit, I knew I was consciousness, and I had a different understanding of things already even before I had uh, woken up from surgery. But everything came back, I remember. So you, you disengage or stop identifying with the body-mind, and you can do that through meditation. And then by going deeper within yourself, you change, just like you change the dial on a radio from 95.9 to 97.9, and now all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of different information, music, that's being broadcast at that frequency. These higher frequencies and higher dimensions are part of our consciousness. We are that. That's what the higher mind is. We reduce ourselves to body consciousness through identification with the body. So I remembered what to do, and I would literally turn my dial, so to speak, my radio dial, so the electromagnetic frequency of my brain to these higher states of consciousness, which was happening to me as a child, you get to a certain point, Jeff, I call it the etch-a-sketch level. So there is a level within our higher mind where form and function of the body is created. The higher consciousness is the architect of our form and the chemist of our biology. So when you go to that state of consciousness, you are literally operating at the blueprint level. And you can begin through your intention, you can begin to put yourself back together by envisioning yourself, how you need to see it, by feeling what that's like, by commanding the energy to come to the areas that you need. And by doing that, it's like a translation. It comes down in frequency. The information comes down that you're doing in a higher frequency. And what you're maneuvering up there with in terms of your own energies eventually comes down and gets translated into the physical body. And so as I was doing these things, I could actually feel what was happening to my body. So I was putting myself back together at the level in which the body is created, if that, if that makes sense. So that was one of the things that I did immediately was to start to go to the Etch-A-Sketch level and put myself back together. All right, let me stop you here for a second. You have a history of being out of your body, so you already have confirmation that you are a spirit and not your body. But for those of us that have heard that you are not your body, and we understand that, but we've never had the experience, so it's hard for us to confirm that. How can we confirm that? Oh, me meditation. Without a doubt, uh, I like to say that the self, what we really are, is meditation. The self is what we are. It exists prior to thinking, prior to emoting, prior to the body, prior to bodily sensation. There is an awareness within us that is aware of every thought, aware of every emotion, aware of our bodily sensations, and aware of every experience that we have. So something must be in place already for a memory to be formed. Something must already be in place for an experience even to happen. And so 
it's easy to get confirmation of these things through, through detachment, through meditation. When you meditate properly, and the book shows all these different ways to meditate, when you meditate properly, one of the things that it will do, it will literally annihilate the idea that you're merely human because you will start to experience different states of consciousness. We just don't do this regularly. All we ever do is think and emote and move our body around. That is the tiniest fraction of what we are capable of, the tiniest fraction. So meditation is the, is the way to do that. And another way to break free of the ego mind identity, this program that we're just body mind, right? Is to literally ask yourself the question, it's as funny as it sounds, but when you ask yourself, who am I? Your mind goes blank. Really think about that first. What does that mean? Who am I? And it's blank. And what actually happens is the energy metaphysically, I know our eyes don't see this, but some people can see this. I can see this. What happens when you say, who am I? The energy drops down out of your mental body. Your mind goes blank because there is no who. It's all one thing. There is no who. And so the who is made up. I'm a this, I'm a that, blah, blah. Those are all identifications which are part of the ego mind identity. What we are comes before that. We slide into this suit, we slide out. So what we are comes before that. And by asking ourselves a simple question of who am I? There's no answer. So who you thought you were and your feelings about yourself are just a story that we tell ourselves, it's not the truth. And so by doing these exercises, asking yourself these simple questions like that, I'll give you another one. People tell me all the time, I can't meditate. I, I, I need to start to have this, just like you said, Jeff, mm -hmm. how do I start this process of self-healing and where do I begin? And I get it. I get it. Okay. So most people can't stop their mind, right? Thinking, thinking the monkey mind takes over, right? And we all know what, we all know what that feels like, right? Okay. And I understand why it's so difficult because we're bombarded all the time with stimulus, right? So we're always trying to process everything. Okay. So here's meditation in one second. All you have to do is pretend that you just arrived here, no past, no future. Hmm. Instant meditation. You can't think. You literally can't because thinking is based upon past, future, past, future, past, future. So if you pretend that you just arrived here, no past, no future. Instant meditation and what you may find, and this is a wonderful starting point, you may actually just like feel something in the center of your chest. And I don't know if that happened for you, Jeff, but when you pretend that you just arrived here, no past, no future, you may start to feel a sensation, a presence, a beingness sitting in the center of your chest. That's because consciousness, when incarnate, resides between the heart and the spine. And that's why everyone indicates themselves when they say me, they point to the center of their chest, me. No one ever goes me and points to their head because there's nothing in here. Just like there's no musicians in the radio. Your consciousness is not in your head. It's actually right here in the center of your chest. And the more that we do these very simple things that take seconds, and these are some of the things I developed for people so they could start to work in this way instead of, you know, jumping right to third base where it's like, well, I need to, I don't know how to start. Just do these basic things so you can start to connect directly with the spirit, with the soul, with the self, with the sentience, with the consciousness. And then once you start to experience that, some level of detachment, okay, starts to happen. You, you get some space between you and thought, emotion, body. And when you get that space, Jeff, that's the room that we need to work. And now we can do things with our energy. Now we can do things with bringing higher frequency energy into us through our crown chakra. There's a whole bunch of things that we can now direct in terms of repair and self healing. Once we have sufficient detachment and a little space to work with them. Hmm. Those are some amazing things you shared with us. So you said there is no who, I guess we're just I. 
Yeah. The, so this, yeah, it, I mean, this rabbit hole goes, goes so deep, right? But um, I like to say that the only statement that is eternally true, and it's two words, I am. That's it. Because really, Jeff, anything you tack on after that, after I am, is not true. Because you are the I am. And you could, you could think of that as the, 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 the God particle or God in action when we say I am. That's it. Everything after that is an identification. Everything after that is a creation, an attachment, an identification. And, and in one way that maybe even makes that more easy. The painter is not the painting, right? I am. And anything after that is a creation. An incarnation is a creation. Thought is a creation. Emotion is a creation. The body is a creation. The experiences that we have is a creation. Memory is a creation. It's actually not what we are. All right. I feel like we got sidetracked. And I need to bring you back to the second part that I think that we haven't got to on how you healed yourself. Yeah, yeah. So there are seven things that I did that are in the book, and I call it the Ascend the Frequencies Healing Technique. So I found myself doing these seven exercises or protocols <clears throat> over and over and over again. And so with this new understanding that I had when I woke up, I then started doing different things with this different understanding and through the different understanding, I got different results. So different understanding, different protocols, different results. So one of the things that I would do is I would go to a higher state of consciousness, like we talked about before, and I would literally see myself and I would literally be putting myself back together in my mind's eye. I would imagine what it feels like, which is very important. I would then verbalize what it is that I was doing. So I was almost giving myself a mantra or a command. And I would say that I'm repairing my spine and putting myself back together now. I'd see it. I would tangibly feel it. I would verbalize it. And sometimes I would even do something with my hands like this to give myself some kind of symbolic gesture that I was creating. Because Jeff, there's only four expressions a human being has, mental, verbal, emotional, and physical. If you combine them into one thing with one single agenda, that has a far greater potential for coming into manifestation because all of our focus, all of our mind, all of our energy, our entire being is focused on one single thing. And so, when you do this for your own healing, the results are incredible because no one thought of this or does this or, or, or hasn't realized it yet. But when you combine everything, all of you, and direct it into one thing, that reality has a far greater chance of coming to manifestation because all of you is going in one direction. So that was another thing that I would do, and I call that a full activation of the healing intention. Now, does this work also for emotional traumas besides physical traumas? Yeah, everything, Jeff. Any imbalance, any imbalance. Because what we're doing is we're returning to what we really are, that I am, the self, right? And not what comes after. So one of the things that we can do if someone is uh, struggling emotionally, right? Let's say depression, right? Uh, or anxiety or an overactive mind, right? We can do that first thing that I showed you because it's really incredible. So let's say we're upset about, about whatever, right? Just ask yourself, who is it that is upset right now? Me, I am. Who am I? Instant dissipation. <laughs> it's. I love Jeff, it how you just go blank. <laughs> Yeah, because it's a story. The whole thing is a story. It's not what we are. And when, and these are real, this is metaphysics. And metaphysics are what we used to call magic. We're moving energy. Now, I can see the energy that we're moving, right? So this is part of how I developed this stuff, because I could actually see what I was, what I was doing, or the information I was being given, or what I remembered, which is probably all the same thing, really. Uh, the, the story that we tell ourselves is the obstacle. So 
when we watch a movie, we know those characters aren't real. We know that. Neither is yours. It's just as fake. It's a story you tell yourself. Because as soon as you question it, it disappears. So, right, now most of us know at this point that if we're full of anxiety and all this kind of stuff, we're really wigging out about whatever, we make ourselves sick. Most people have now come to, you know, thank goodness, right? We now know we have to take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, right? We're at that level where I'm making myself sick because I'm so stressed out. Okay. Whatever conceptualized reality that we create for ourselves, the body then has the tangible experience of that, right? That's the mind-body connection in one sentence. Okay. We now know that if we make ourselves crazy, so to speak, we make ourselves sick. Jeff, the other side of that is also true. So by experiencing an increased or expanded state of consciousness, the body also has the tangible experience of that as well. And this is part of the paradigm shift. For some reason, we thought it only worked one way. It does not. It works the other way as well. So through this tremendous expanded state of consciousness, your body has that experience as well. And in this expanded state of consciousness, it is very difficult to be sick. And in this expanded state of consciousness, we can then make the body have that experience, just like whatever conceptualized reality we create, the body has the tangible experience of that. Expand your mind to this point of divinity, of limitless, of a limitless nature, because it's true. Your body then literally starts to repair itself because it has to. The body follows the mind. It has to. So that, as I said to me, that's part of the paradigm shift. And when we operate that way, the results that you get are, they're beyond anything because now we have a different understanding. We're doing different things. You get a different result. Now, when you're doing the paradigm shift, it's the mind changing, but emotional traumas are, I would assume, are also mental. So shifting the mind heals the mind, just like the, it heals the body. You got Correct? it. Yeah, abs absolutely. So my understanding is that, you know, when we have a thought, right, it's the identification with the thought that gives it its weight. Okay. All thoughts are equal in weightlessness. All of them. They're like a cloud. Every thought. It's our believing in the thought that gives it its weight and its gravitas and its, its, uh, its dominion over our consciousness by believing in the thought. Now, when we believe in the thought, what's actually happening metaphysically is that we are bathing that thought in emotion through identification. So what's actually happening is we are emotionalizing the thought through the identification with it, right? Now, once we have a thought and we emotionalize it, through the identification with it, the bathing of it in the emotion, now we take an action. So it takes those two things for, this is what I've found through my own higher consciousness, is that those two things have to take place in order for us to make an action, okay? Now, thoughts and emotions are not what we are. So in other words, we're taking ourselves further and further and further away with every thought and emotion from what we really are. The painter is not the painting. And as we keep thinking and emoting, we're creating a bigger story for ourselves, and we're taking ourselves more and more and more out of alignment. So the key is to be able to do these little things that I just talked about. Pretend you just arrived here, no past, no future. Everything goes back to normal. Now that is the starting point for self-repair and self-healing. You don't heal yourself through thought. You don't heal yourself through emotion. You don't heal yourself through belief either. That's spiritual fiction. You hear yourself prior to those things because that's what you are prior. The divinity and the perfection is prior to all of that. So as you, that's the starting point. So as you return to that, you're putting yourself back in harmony. The body wants to repair and heal itself. We get a cut, it scabs over, right? New cells are being born constantly. The body wants to repair it. We keep misprogramming it because we haven't gained dominion over the mind. And once we gain dominion over the mind, the energy drops down. Now we're in this meditative state and now we have some space. Now we can do meta metaphysical exercises that bring higher frequency energy through our own higher mind right directly into our body. 
And this is part of how I literally put myself back together. Hmm. If we go one step deeper, do we already know all this stuff before we're incarnated? And two, if you can follow up with that, why do we come here in the first place? Okay. Those are two great questions. Okay. And, and if I forget to answer the second one, remind me because I want to answer okay. both of those. Okay. Uh, do we understand this uh, prior to incarnation? Yes. So everything I'm talking about is accessible to us and known to us when we're existing in a, a much more holistic and much more aware state. So we're, we are beyond what even being human is. So in a, in a sense, I'm trying to give a visual. We look down at it and we can see everything that goes on. We can see all the metaphysics. We can see the whole thing and understand it completely. Now, I just remembered. Really, that's why I said as a little kid, if I ever get sick, I'll just heal myself. So I knew it was in this life plan that I would have to remember this, thank goodness, so that, and how to do this and then be able to teach it. So yes, we absolutely know this and remember this. Now, when we're now incarnate, Jeff, we reduce ourselves to what I explained in the book to body consciousness. That's, that's what I call it. So that, <clears throat> so that just means five senses and whatever our five senses can perceive. And anything outside of that, we have, we have no familiarity, no availability, no access to it. Our five physical senses perceive 0 0.003 of what exists in the quantum field. 0 0.003. Nothing. Hmm. We reduce ourselves to nothing when we reduce ourselves to body consciousness. So it's through meditation we can go back into our own higher mind where all the wisdom, all the love, all the memory of all this understanding and knowledge exists, and then you can start to access it and apply it. So yes, most of what I say to people that I teach all over the world, as soon as I say it, there's a recognition of it. Why is that? Because they're remembering. This is nothing new. This is just the way I explain it. You know, This information is not new. Everyone knows this. Everyone feels deep down inside they can heal themselves because many of us have. It's a memory. I remember it as a kid. If I just get, if I just heal myself, I get sick. So everyone knows this is within them. We just have to remember. We have to reawaken ourselves. And this is what's happened to me through my own self-realization, enlightenment, whatever word you want to use. I don't care. I, I just remembered everything. So yes, all of us can do this, and many of us have done it before. And all of us understand this before we get here. Once we get here, we reduce ourselves. It's like total amnesia. It's like waking up on the bottom of the ocean in a diving suit with total amnesia, having no idea how you got there, who you are, what you're doing, what's the purpose, and why, why, why are we here, right? That's part of the incarnation. Because as we come down, we lose consciousness. We literally, and then we see ourselves in the suit, so we think we're human. We think we're, this is where we're from. This is all there is. It's all I can access. And then you leave your body. It's like going back on land. Ah, oh, you feel better. You can move around better. You can see better. You understand everything better, right? Functionality, mobility is greatly increased. This is what happens when you're out of your body. It's the same thing. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but the answer is yes, uh, we do know this, and this is a remembering. And Jeff, you're, I knew I'd forget the second part of your question. And the, sec and the second part <laughs> is why do we do this? Yeah, okay, right, okay. So my understanding is that The, the one directive that existence has is to, is to know itself, to know thyself, right? All existence, all consciousness, everything is to understand itself, right? Self-realization, enlightenment, right? So that is the one directive. And in order to do that, we have to experience everything within God's multiverse, which includes the low frequencies of uh, the physical universe. So this is just simply a, an area within what source God created that we experience. We experience all the way down here. We experience all the way up here. We experience in the middle, over here, over here. So it, it is for us to explore ourselves within a different environment. And the key is to recognize or realize the self, self-realization, to realize the self in every single arena, frequency, dimension, reality of God's multiverse. So we come here because we can. 
We come here because it's a unique experience. Only in the low frequencies of the physical universe does physicality, tangibility, solidity actually even exists. We have to come here to experience the, the tangibility of our intention. Because when we're in a higher state of consciousness and existing in a higher frequency, higher dimension, Jeff, there's no physicality at all. None. It, it, everything is ephemeral, so to speak, right? This is where you know, there's physicality, there's solidity. So it's a great challenge to come here as an energy being and experience physical reality. And it's a way for our consciousness to evolve by having this experience. We, we learn things about ourselves here that you can't learn anywhere else. All right. So after you healed yourself, did you go back to the hospital or the rehab facilities and show everybody that you're walking around? And if so, how did they react? Yeah, I did. I did do that. Um, on the, the homepage of my website, there is a video of uh, me and it's time stamped of me unparalyzing myself. So you can even see me back in the hospital rehab. And then towards the end, you see me in Kauai walking up a gigantic hill. But I did go back. I wanted to go back because my understanding and what they all told me is that they don't see anyone get better. You don't stay at one of these facilities to um, repair yourself. You stay at these facilities so you can exist when you get discharged and occupational therapy, so to speak. Right. So they teach you how to be able to put your socks on when you're paralyzed or how to, how to wheel your wheelchair up to the, to the sink. So you know how to shave and brush your teeth again. So you can maneuver. They don't see anyone get better and people don't get better from paralysis. So yeah, one of the things that I did is I, I went back there. There were a lot of tears. I have about 18 hours of footage interviewing the neurosurgeon, the doctor, my physical therapist, some of my nurses, uh, and they weren't the only one crying. I was crying as well. It was, it was remarkable. And one, the one thing that stood out out of all of that was one of the main nurses that I had when I was there for a couple of months. I was, uh, I showed back up and she, obviously I was walking around and she just started crying immediately and she was so happy. And what she said, I'll never forget. She said, RJ, we never, ever, ever see anyone get better. It's like, we're doing all this work and no one ever is better. And to see someone actually standing and walking around is the greatest gift you could have ever given me. Hmm. I'll, that's emotional even talk about because I'll never, ever forget that. And I told them all that I would walk. I told them that I would do it. And some of them started to see what was happening even while I was there. And pretty soon they were on board. Like, oh, this guy's going to do it. He's absolutely going to do it. And to be able to experience the, the victory, the triumph of the will with them, it, there's, there's nothing better. And I wanted to thank them for all their endless work. Because what they do is, I, I mean it, it's God's work. They're caring for people who cannot care for themselves. There are brain injury, uh, you know, children there, people like myself, you know, through an infection, car accidents, you know, motorcycle wrecks. You know, these are people whose body, body mind complexes are heavily compromised. And these people are the ones that take care of them. Where do you think sickness and ill health comes from? the ego mind identity. So all disharmony comes from disharmonious thought patterns. Can you explain more what the ego mind identity is? Yes. Yeah. This is the, the book. Uh, and this is one of the more important uh, paradigm shifts in, in terms of this new information. So the book, the book, I think I spend, I don't remember, but maybe the first 20 pages going on and on and on about what the ego mind identity is, how it's formed and, and how it operates. Okay. The ego mind identity, without me going on and on and on, right. is, is essentially the character, the human character that we create that actually has nothing to do with the I am. Okay, It's all our thought patterns, which are always in relation to our identifications. right? So the ego mind identity is not what we are. It's who we think we are and how we feel about ourselves. And it's a total limitation because it's only based upon identification with the body and then body consciousness. So we limit this immortal divine being that's directly connected to God, we limit it to a body, five senses, and an intellect. 
that can only take in what the five senses take in, 0.003. Nothing. So the ego mind identity is a limitation program that runs by thinking. We are not this. Just like we watch a movie, we know those characters aren't real. The character that we create isn't real. That's why when I ask, who am I? There's your proof. No answer, right? Okay. So the ego mind identity, Jeff, is this tremendous contraction of our consciousness and energy. And it's how we think, it's how we see things, it's how we operate, and it starts with thinking that we're the body. It's a massive, massive limitation of our own consciousness. Everything becomes rational mind. Everything, everything, everything. Imagination is gone. Higher mind is gone. And that's what we are. That's what we are. We're not the suit. So the ego mind identity is the association and the thought patterns in relation to thinking that you're human. That limits your consciousness. You're now bound by every limitation that's here. You've got to do what this person says. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't. It's nonsense. There's no other way to say it. It's nonsense. So the ego mind identity is the human character that we create based upon the identification that this is all we are. So that's what the ego mind identity is. And every thought is in relation to our identifications. And this is how we get sick because it's not true. We're living a lie. You call the ego mind identity, the false self, the shadow self, the slave self, whatever, whatever all the world's a stage as Shakespeare said. So we create this character that is not who we are. We come before the character and the, the ego mind identity is a gigantic, massive limitation program. And the subsets of that limitation program are sickness and disease because we have taken ourselves out of harmony. We have taken ourselves, we have severed the direct connection with the self and created this false character that is not who we are. So all sickness and disease are subsets of the main program of the ego mind identity. We take ourselves out of balance. That's what? where we get sickness and disease from. Would that even include if they have some kind of genetic predisposition or they were born that way? Yeah, so the genetic entity, the physical body, which I call a genetic entity. So your hereditary, your traits, your genetics are based upon every soul that ever incarnated within that hereditary line prior. So that means it includes all the social social conditioning, all the thought patterns, all the emotional patterns of every single soul that ever incarnated within that genetic line. So essentially you're incarnating into your ancestors. Okay. So that's what genetics and hereditary. Now, some bodies, mine had certain predispositions that type one diabetes, you know, I was automatically susceptible to this that had the body, which, which isn't me, but the sentience that's inside what we really are is in control. We command the body mind. Now, unless we command the body mind, then the genetics and the hereditary traits will take over because we haven't exercised our dominion over it. I'm type one or been diagnosed as type one diabetic. I don't take insulin. That's impossible. No, it's not. No, it's not. So when the self, the sentience takes over, think about it. We tell our body mind what to do all the time. We just don't think we can do this in terms of healing. We can. You may have already covered this, but if not, can you give us ways to stop the EMI? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. That's great, Jeff. Um, we, we, yeah, we did do a couple of those things. So as I say, the, e, the EMI, the ego mind identity, is a limitation program that runs by thinking. Okay, what's the remedy to thinking? Meditation, right? Okay. And as we talked about a little bit before, many people have a hard time meditating, and I, and I understand. Okay. So all we want to do is we, we want to stop the thought process, hence, which is meditation. So there's many things that we can do, and the book is literally filled with them. And we went over, pretend you just arrived here, no past, no future. Everything stops, limited, no thinking, you're not meditating. Um, you can also ask yourself a question that you sincerely don't know the answer to, and you don't care what the answer is. For example... How many hairs are there on a cat? I don't know. Okay, right? No one really, I don't think anyone. So you don't know and you don't care. 
This is so important. These things seem so simple. They're so profound. Within simplicity, there's a power and an elegance because what's really happening is the energy is draining out of your mental body and out of your emotional body. This is the starting point for healing. This is the starting point for stopping the ego mind identity, which runs by thinking, 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 thinking. So we simply want the energy to drop out of the mental body and out of the emotional body. And that's another thing that we can do, Jeff, to stop the ego mind identity from running. So just do it with me as I do it. We've all seen water drained from a bathtub, from a sink, from a pool, from wherever, right? Okay. So right now, just imagine like water draining from a bathtub, the energy dropping down out of your head, like water draining down. Now your mind's empty and let the energy, let the water keep draining further down, further down, past your chest, past your stomach, and then right back down below your belly button. Stop there. Can't think, can't emote. Instant meditation. The EMI has stopped. Now all we want to do is normalize this. Now you can be in a perpetual state of meditation. Healing has begun. You're now making the steps towards self-realization because you are now experiencing yourself directly, not what you produce, thoughts, emotions. Self-realization is experiencing the self directly. Healing is tapping into the self directly and the body automatically wants to repair itself. And then the steps in the book show you how to do it. But by stopping the ego mind identity, you finally experience yourself. And as you're finding out, Jeff, look how easy this is, right? Because the truth doesn't require your participation. Lies do. A dog doesn't have to try to be a dog. It's a dog. You, my friend, don't have to try to be yourself. You are yourself. The effort is in trying to be the ego mind identity. And that's how we get thrown out of whack. And that's how we get sick. And that's why we age. That's why there's eventual decrepitude and demise. When you're closely aligned with yourself, all those things are so slowed down completely slowed down. There's actually even a way to stop them. But this is how you do it. You stop the ego mind identity by simply removing the energy out of the mental body, just like water draining from a bathtub. Simple and immediate and tangible. And that's how you know you're working with the truth. It's not some mental machination that go, oh, you got to do this for 20 minutes and uh, you know, blah, 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 or whatever it is, right? That's not self-mastery. Self-mastery is immediate, concise, and tangible. That's how you know you're working with the truth. And this is how healing works. So do you think we can get to a point where throughout the day, we're existing at long periods of times without thinking, just being? Yes. Okay. And I'll prove it. Okay. So, Jeff, you and I have had a wonderful conversation about some fairly high-level stuff, right, and so to speak, right? Okay. You have understood every word I've said without thinking. Sit with that for one second because it's profound. You have understood every word I've said without thinking. Understanding, tangible understanding, and real communion happens when you don't think. So if we can commune, connect, and understand each other without thinking, how important can thinking really be? And what is thinking? What is it, actually? Hmm? That's okay. a great question. What is it? Yeah, it's the movement of the past. Thinking hmm. is the movement of the past, which we then take and then project into now, which becomes our future. Let me say that. Maybe I said that too fast. Okay. Thinking is almost like, just as a visual, you're mentally flipping through your Rolodex of past memories. 
right? That's thinking. And then the future is actually the past. Stay with me. The future is actually the past because you have to have a past to even project it into a future. So the future is always based upon the past. And in that sense, the future is the past. They're mental concepts. So thinking is just the flipping through the the mental Rolodex of past impressions, which you then project into a future. What about when people are worrying about the future? Right, Right. So thinking is a rejection of now. Thinking is the non-acceptance of now. And this is why we get, yeah, this is why we get sick, Mm -hmm. right? We're not fully in our body. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you use the word, the rejection of now. Why are we rejecting it? Fear. Fear. Because this experience, incarnation, especially in the lower frequencies of the physical universe, uh, is so foreign to us. This is not home. No one's from here. No one. And nothing is from here. This is, you know, when, you, when you're in a neighborhood you're not familiar with, you're driving, so to speak, or even walking, right? You're just a little more tentative, mm-hmm. right? You don't know the turns. You don't know the neighborhood. You don't know what's, you're, you, you're tentative. You're, you're pensive about it. You could even say there's a level of fear. It's increased when you incarnate here. This is not, we come here with total amnesia and this is not home. So because we're so disconnected, we're fearful. And so we, we create all these barriers for ourselves through our own identifications because that's what protects us, right? I'm a this, I'm a that. We have this sort of energetic shield, this energetic prison. It's absolutely based upon fear. If we were totally comfortable with ourselves, we would just be present. So it's like we're all here operating on a somewhat level of fear. Yeah. But when we yeah. go into meditation, the fear dissipates? It disappears. Because you connect with the self. So the self is immortal. It's an immortal creator being. What does an immortal creator being have to fear? Right. Nothing. Now, can we take this to one further level and use these techniques to manifest things in our life that we want? A hundred percent. The, the, the book is, the book is on self-healing, a whole new paradigm and understanding of self-healing, but it applies to everything. It absolutely applies to everything. So I'll give you an example about manifestation. Okay. So the order of create, as I understand it, Jeff, the order of creation, okay, is desire, intention, thought, emotion, action, behavior. Okay. As I experience it and understand it, that is literally the order of creation. Okay. Desire and intention are higher frequencies and higher frequencies are more potent and powerful than lower frequencies. And in fact, what goes on in higher frequencies really dictates what happens in lower frequencies, right? You can even think of subconscious mind and conscious mind. Our our entire behavior is based upon our subconscious mind, which we don't see. So when we start to, if we want to manifest something, we want to achieve something like walking, or making more money or whatever it is. It doesn't really even matter, actually. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to operate at the desire and intention level and stay that way. So the analogy is if you're going to go to the – because the desire and intention is higher frequency and it's more powerful. That, that's why. Okay. Because it's the first two steps in the order of creation. So you want to marry yourself to that desire and intention completely. Unification with the desire and intention. You become one with it. And now your will is unbreakable. Okay. That's how you manifest. Now, the analogy, if you will, it's a silly analogy, but hopefully it's helpful. Okay. So, Jeff, let's say you're going to get, you want to go to the grocery store, right? You get in your car and you turn your GPS on, right? Okay. You, the GPS is your intention. You have now set your intention to go to the store. You don't even think about whether you're going to get there or not. You know you're gonna go, you know you're gonna get there. You know you're gonna arrive there. And all you do is follow, turn left here, turn right here, merge on the highway here. You never doubt that you're gonna get there. I hope not, right? You kind of just know that you're gonna get to the store. If you follow the intention, if you follow the GPS, it is inevitable 
that you will end up at the store. This is how manifestation works. No one, hopefully, pulls over halfway to the store doubting that they'll ever get there. I don't know if we're ever actually going to get there. I know we're on the GPS. Yeah, I just I, I have my real doubts that we're ever going to get there. Okay, look what we do to ourselves, right? The ego mind doubts everything. This is why we suffer in terms of not being able to manifest the life that we truly desire because we don't follow through on the desire and intention to go to the store. We let the ego mind, desire, intention, thought, emotion, we let the lower frequencies get in the way and it sends a contradictory electrical impulse. And so now instead of going to the grocery store, now all of a sudden we're headed in this direction. You're not getting closer to the grocery store because you've lost the connection to the desire and intention through thought, which is, which is doubt. So if you want to manifest something, you marry yourself, you marry your consciousness and your body of energy to the desire and intention. So there's absolutely no separation. Now, the only thing that can happen is that you will manifest. If you follow the directions on your GPS, you'll get to the store by not doubting. And doubting, by the way, creates an alternative reality or a parallel reality that you actually don't desire. That's really what a parallel reality is. The energy is now going in a completely different direction. So manifestation, Jeff, and I'm glad you asked that. That's, and I'll probably do a book on that, but specifically about that. But that's how you do it. Desire and intention, marry yourself to that. And the only thing that can happen is you get to the store. And that's, from my, from my perspective, that's how manifestation works. Let's see here. All right, RJ. Um, time has flown by through this podcast, <laughs> and I want to let people know where to find you and where to get your book. Sure. Yeah. So the website or my website is ascendthefrequencies.com. And uh, my first book, Supercharged Self-Healing, is uh, available on Amazon and it's in Kindle, audio, CD, paperback. It already went into its uh, second printing. So thank you very much for everyone who's bought that. Um, but it's, it's revolutionary. It's a new paradigm. It'll teach you things and show you things that are extraordinarily simple, yet mind bogglingly powerful. And you can use the teachings in the book, not just to learn how to meditate effortlessly to self heal, self repair, authentic self realization or enlightenment by following these steps. And it applies to everything, personal life, business, whatever it is that you want to achieve, you're going to now know the metaphysics in terms of how to make something come into manifestation. People from my podcast may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, yeah. how can they reach you? Yeah, absolutely. Our, uh, my email address, oddly enough, is rj at ascendthefrequencies.com. Mm -hmm. Please feel, feel free to reach out to me. I, I answer everyone's email, so I can't do it right away most of the time. But I will answer uh, any sincere question. I will absolutely answer. And you also have a YouTube channel, right? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel, Ascend the Frequencies. I have an Instagram, uh, Ascend the Frequencies 12. Um, and something that I'm actually really proud of is that uh, I developed a mobile app hmm. from, the, from this book, Supercharged Self-Healing. Um, myself and my team spent five months uh, putting this mobile app together. It has 3D modeling. So I hired a company that captured some of the things that I see from, you know, from a higher state or altered state of consciousness. So we have 3D modeling, whiteboard animation, computer graphics, uh, videos. There's 25 hours of video alone on this mobile app. It teaches everything that's in the book and then some things that the publisher wouldn't let me put in there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's revolutionary. And for, for those that are really interested in understanding the metaphysics for their own self-healing and their own self-realization, there's never been anything uh, like the supercharged self-healing mobile app. Great. All right, RJ, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Give yourself permission to heal. Give yourself permission to heal. Your doctor might not give it to you, your chiropractor, your wife, your husband, whoever. It starts and ends with you. You are that powerful. You are so powerful, you have no idea yet. And what I want for you to realize is how powerful you really are. Give yourself permission to heal. It is your divine right. It is your destiny to do this. 
It starts and ends with you. There is nothing you can't do when you follow those protocols about desire, intention, thought, emotion, action, and behavior. There is nothing that you can't do in terms of getting better or achieving in your life. It starts and ends with you. And what you are is eternally whole and complete and divine. You are not missing anything. You are not lacking anything. You never have and you never will. It's impossible. That's just the mind. You are so much more than the mind. Get the book. Avail yourself of this. Lead the life that you want. It's up to you. RJ, thank you for that message. And when you get your next book out, definitely look me up so we can get you back to talk about that and more. That's, that sounds great. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you very much, Jeff. I enjoyed every second of it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for being my guest. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.